A few weeks ago, we talked to you briefly about the subject of forgiveness. And we know that forgiveness is a big issue for all of us. And there are many layers of forgiveness in adultery recovery. The spouse forgiving the infidel for what they did. The spouse forgiving the partner for damages done to the spouse and the family. The infidel forgiving the spouse for unmet needs, whether they're real or perceived. The infidel forgiving themselves for choosing adultery in the first place and both of you forgiving each other and yourselves for the weakened areas in your marriages. Now we defined what forgiveness is, that it means to cease to demand a penalty, to cease to blame, to, to release, or to, to set free. Well, those definitions are summed up best this way. It is letting go of the resentment for being wronged. And that's pretty hard especially when there's been a significant and damaging hurt. And we also talked about what forgiveness is not. It's like not containing our resentment or pretending that it isn't there. It's not letting someone off the moral hook, ignoring or disregarding the wrong that's been done. It's not an excuse. I mean, we, we can't say, well, they had no alternative but to do that. And it's not forgetting. I mean, it's not some sort of sentimental amnesia. And finally, forgiveness is not trust. Now, there are two separate issues here. I mean, I can forgive someone for recklessly smashing my car. I can cancel that debt. But that doesn't mean that I'll hand that same person the keys to my new car and then put my kids in the back seat. <laughs> That's trust. Rebuilding trust requires the cooperation of more than one person. And forgiveness does not. Now, what forgiveness really is, that ceasing to blame, that Letting go, that's tough, and it's against our human nature. And most of us struggle with forgiveness. I mean, forgiveness is a biggie. There's a lot of information out there on forgiveness, some of it written by very well-known and very godly people, and some not. Truth is that not everyone agrees on everything. So this week, we're going to look at the one reliable source, God himself. You see, he's an expert on forgiveness. He knows exactly what forgiveness costs and what unforgiveness costs. And as believers, we know that his word, the Bible, is truth, absolute truth. So let's explore together what God has to say, what Jesus taught his people. Now let me read with you from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Now this passage is often called the Lord's Prayer. It's Jesus teaching us how to pray. Beginning at verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, Jesus says in verse 12, forgive us as we have forgiven others. Problem is, we stop at verse 13. Later in verses 14 and 15, he explains the relationship between our forgiveness of others and his forgiveness of us. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. You see, you do, he will. You don't, he won't. Remember a few weeks ago when we discussed the words used in Scripture for forgive? We said the Greek word meant to send away or to release a debt. Now, who is Jesus talking to in this passage? Go back up to chapter 5, verse 1. Now when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. He was talking to his disciples. He was relating that to disobey in this respect, to not forgive, is to ensure that what we need to be forgiven for will not be sent away from us. They will stay with us. We'll be living with them day after day after day. I think about what happens to people who cannot forgive. I mean, they become embittered, and it's almost like they're walking around with a chain around their neck. 
He's speaking to those who would call themselves his disciples, his children. God's forgiveness for salvation removes the chasm between man and God. It builds a bridge, if you will, but we must still cross that bridge. That's our job. We have to cross the bridge, and we need to accept that forgiveness and all that that implies. Unforgiveness blocks joy. It blocks peace. We look down from the bridge we're trying to cross. We get stuck in the crossing of that bridge, and that interferes with our relationship with God. Let's look again at verse 13, which precedes this warning. Verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, could one of those temptations be to not forgive? And does that not forgiving give Satan easier access to cause more interference? Christ came to reconcile us to God, absolutely. But he also came to reconcile us to one another. Let's look at another passage in Scripture on forgiveness for some more insight. It's found again in Matthew at chapter 18, a passage often called the parable of the unmerciful servant. It all begins at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, why do you think Peter asked that question? Do you think Peter might have been struggling with a forgiveness issue? I really like Peter. Throughout Scripture, we see that he was emotional and reactive, a real person, and one who truly loved his Lord. I believe he had a reason for asking Jesus how many times he needed to forgive his brother. Listen to Jesus' answer in verse 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy times seven. Now, I doubt that's what Pete wanted to hear. He was probably hoping for something more like, Oh, Peter, you've done enough. But Jesus had something important to say, and as he commonly did, he used a story to illustrate a truth. Verse 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Just what is the kingdom of heaven? Is it only some place we go after this life? No, it exists in and around God and his children. The kingdom is wherever God is sovereign. So let's read on in verses 24 through 27. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he, his wife, and his children, and all that he had, be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Oh, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Now, what the servant owed was huge. New Bible Commentary tells us that 10,000 talents combines the largest Greek numeral with the largest unit of currency. Even one talent was a small fortune, much less 10,000. And there is no indication that this was anything other than a very real debt. The servant asked for mercy because he knew a debt was owed, a debt that he could not pay. And the king granted it by canceling a debt. Let's read on in verses 28 through 30. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now again, there's no indication that this debt was fabricated or false. It, too, was a very real debt owed. However, this amount was very small in comparison to the larger debt owed by the servant whose master had forgiven him. The one who had just been graciously given mercy denies the same to another. Now both of these men were guilty. Both owed a debt. As Christians, we have been forgiven a very large debt. I believe that we are unable to fully comprehend the value of that debt, much less the mercy we've received from our Lord and the true cost of that mercy. Let's continue with verses 31 through 35. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, the servant who had been forgiven. 
You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Well, what happened to this unmerciful servant? He was jailed and handed over to the jailers to be tortured. Then we read verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Well, what does that mean? It means that unforgiveness ensures being tortured. When you think about those embittered people you know, you remember and realize that they are more miserable than even those around them. There are tortures worse than physical ones, and Satan is the king of them all. So the question is, how do we make sure this doesn't happen to us? And the answer is forgive. Forgive from the heart. Now, when Scripture talks about your heart, it's usually talking about that hidden man inside you, your true character, the actual seat of who you are morally and spiritually. We may struggle here, but what God has called us to do is pretty understandable. So, with these two passages from God's Word in mind, let's discuss those two reasons to forgive that we briefly hit on a few weeks ago. So why should you bother to forgive? Well, two very compelling reasons, in my opinion. Number one, forgive in obedience to God. The decision to forgive begins a process of obedience. This is a choice, an act of the will, not of the emotions. Forgiveness takes time because of our emotions. It's a process, moment by moment, thought by thought, that we decide if we will obey. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Forgive as Christ forgave. Remember that word forgave means to grant grace. The instructions imply that we have what we need to do this. God empowers us to do what he asks. Philippians 2.13 tells us, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. God not only supplies the power, but also creates the desire, and he will give us what we need to enable us to obey him. Now, the second reason to forgive is that forgiving frees us from sin's control, from oppression. It frees us from torture. It's been said that forgiveness is not making the sin okay, but making you okay. It helps you to survive as a whole and healthy being. It is part of fully healing, and it is the real forgetting. It's when we no longer allow our past resentments to be the judge of the one who wronged us. Galatians 5.1 tells us, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, as believers, we are equal in standing before God, and we all have the same access, the same tools. We do not have to be oppressed. So the question now is, if I agree with this, if I believe this, then how do I do it? How can I be obedient when pain and anger are all I can see and feel? And I have every reason to feel that way. Well, I understand these questions because I had them too. And I want to give you five suggestions, five practical things that you can begin with right now, five tangible, realistic, possible things that can lead you down the road of forgiveness. Number one, focus on you and God. Focus on your relationship. It may be maintaining your relationship, or maybe it's restoring your broken relationship with Him. You can't do this forgiveness thing alone. Don't even try. And you may have to begin with asking God to even give you the desire to be obedient. There's no sense in pretending. He knows how you feel. Ask Him to empower you to be the Christian He has called you to be. You need to spend time with God, just you and He alone, in prayer and in His Word. Look up everything you can find on forgiveness in the Bible. Talk to him about what he said and repeat these truths to yourself until you recognize them as truths. Number two, recognize and acknowledge the hurt and the pain. 
an injury has occurred, and denying it only gives that pain more power. If you cannot share your hurt or how you have been hurt because of the pain that sharing evokes, then you can know it is a very real and unhealed wound, painful even to the touch. Now, I'm not talking about sharing to cause pain to the inflictor of your pain. This may very likely be just a sharing with God alone, or, or perhaps a Christian counselor, or a godly, trustworthy fellow believer. Some people have even been known to write everything down in vivid, horrid detail, using all the words they think of, and then burning that paper. The point is to clean out the wound. As if it were a pocket of infection, it must be cleaned out and treated with the balm of God so that it can heal. Number three, let go of the blame. Oh, this is difficult. We want to know why. We want a reason. And blame seeks to find the culprit, to assign the role of villain, so we can know just who we can blame. The truth is there will never be a good enough reason for some of the wrongs done to us. Stop looking. Stop reliving them over and over in your mind. Start replacing those thoughts with God's thoughts, His Word. Forgiveness can begin when we start moving toward recognition of our joint participation, either in the incident itself or in keeping the blame alive and well. Number four, begin to see the other person as a person of value. Every human being is precious in God's eyes. Every human being was created in God's image. Jesus died for us all, not just those of us we consider worthy. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Oh, this is God's perspective, not man's. Remember we said forgiveness is the real forgetting? It means that when we look at the person who caused our pain, we do not see just a liar or a cheat or a destroyer. Rather, we see them as God's creation. Leave the final determination to Jesus. And then lastly, number five, work towards forgiveness. You see, forgiveness is a goal to be pursued. It's not a prize. We can repeatedly lose and gain ground two steps forward, one step back, and it's very hard work, but it's worth it. Beth Moore says this, Forgiveness involves my handing over to God the responsibility for justice. You see, forgiveness can be paralleled with the Christian life because forgiveness, it's a process. It's a direction you're taking. It's a gift that we can give and a gift that we can receive. And it's a choice. Nobody can make you do this. You need God now maybe more than any other time in your life. Don't block your relationship with Him. Don't travel this road alone. I believe, I know, that when we are obedient to God, He rewards us. And choosing this path out of obedience is the first step to rekindling the love and trust that have been damaged in your marriage. Emotions often follow our actions, follow behind our obedience. Trust God. He is trustworthy.